the stumbling block, that that was going to be the hurdle, the narrative of millions of dollars of deferred maintenance, low volunteerism, aging congregations, declining attendance, budget shortfalls was occupying their minds to where they didn't have the energy to consider what different could look like. So that got me to a place where I'm at today, um, is working with Trinity Center's foundation, where our mission is to transform church properties for community impact. Is what would it look like for our spaces, the, the places in which we inhabit for a few hours on a Sunday, what if they were animated all week? What if we had, <coughs> excuse me, people in these spaces who were part of a partnership, an ecosystem in which we were part of that with? Applying a new social business model that generates both societal and economic value, giving kickbacks to the church, which is important because we need a sustainable financial future, but also societal good within the neighborhoods that we're in. So I'm a believer that those with the best stories win. And sadly, the church hasn't had a very good story lately. We're not knowing for our imagination. We're not knowing for our experiments. We're not knowing for our innovation. But we once were. And I think we can get back to that, back to what it is to be an innovating people. You can go to the next slide. I don't even know. I'm just talking. Um, yeah, without stories, the land turns into real estate. It's just a building. But we need people. We need stories and new ideas need old buildings. Jane Jacob is just one of my heroes. You can go to the next slide. So here is the reality that we often face or feel is we're alone. We've got the financial challenges, as I talked about, aging congregation, purpose, low attendance, lack of missional imagination, deferred maintenance. We feel alone in the story. And I want to tell you that you're not alone, that there are thousands upon thousands of churches across Canada and the U.S. that are facing the same story. We need a new imagination on what it looks like to move forward. But we don't have to go at it alone. We can have trusted guides, those who can come alongside um, and help us along the way. Next one. Typically, 5% of a current building is used in a given week. So we're not stewarding the asset well. We have 5% of our buildings that are inhabited, 5% that are used. If you were to go out those doors and around this building, you'd see that most of it is unused. And that's a current reality. If we show up on a Wednesday or a Tuesday, how much of the building is being inhabited by Voices and laughter and communication and conversation and activities. Across Canada, we see our churches underutilized. Continue. What we want to believe is that we don't have to go at it alone. That there is possible imagination that can emerge if we work together. What if it looked like municipalities? the civic society, different organizations and non-for-profits, culture shifters, those who have creative imagination, who are out there in our neighborhoods and our communities, funders, heritage groups, other local churches. What if we came together and imagined a new reality, a future in our communities that was about our togetherness, not us feeling alone? And that's what we're seeing happen as we move to really transitioning church buildings to, to, uh, for more community impact. We're seeing so many partners and people come out of the surface, bubble up animators and innovators who are already here in our neighborhoods, but we just need to go on a treasure hunt to find where they are and what they're doing and invite them to join so we can partner together. The next one. Transforming faith properties for community impact. We want to see our communities impacted. 
in a positive way. We envision the historical land wealth of Canada's faith communities redeployed. How do we redeploy where it's not us as owners, but us as stewards for this equitable future that we can hold together? Reimagining requires us asking different questions. And we get stuck in what I call church questions. What, what are some church questions that churches are good at asking? Maybe personally you're discovering this in committee meetings or here, but maybe you guys are, are also more advanced. So it's just general. What are some church examples of church questions that we may ask? Yeah. Yeah, what about the money, the budget, the shortfall? We just heard a great overview of that. But yeah, what about the finances? What's another church question? Yeah, where, where, and you can even go a little bit more. Where are all the young people? I get that one a lot. Where are the young families? Where are they going? Yes. Another church question. Just keep shouting them out. What programs are we going to do? Yes. What events are going to happen? How do we get more volunteers in committee meetings? Or on, to sit on committees? What's another one? Yeah, whatever. How many people came? So our metrics, our numbers, and money are often, right? Anyone else, anyone else got some great church questions? What about the pews? It's a great church question. <laughs> what are we going to do with the pews? What songs are we going to sing? What style of music? We've always done it this way. Why should we change? What else? Right. Why don't the minister rigs that? Yes. Yep. Why are we not relevant? No, that's a good question. That's a, that's a different one. I like that one. We need to ask that one more often. <laughs> Any other church questions that kind of, now, as we go through those questions, is anyone feeling inspiration? Deborah did a beautiful message today on the spirit that kind of wells up inside. Is anyone feeling the spirit alive and activated as we ask those questions? I don't. Discouragement, anxiety, worry, resentment. Wow, good one. That's what bubbles up for me. So what does it look like to ask different questions? What if we ask neighborhood questions? Or to use a church word, what if we ask God questions? That moves us from scarcity, which is about worry and fear and anxiety, to more of a God question, neighborhood question that could create some wonder, possibility. What would be an example of some neighborhood or God questions? We had a, our first one well, about being relevant. Um, we could unpack that for a long time. Yes. What are the needs of the community? What, are this, what stories are they living into? What are their needs? Because I'll tell you this. Most churches are meeting needs that neighbors are not asking for. They're not asking for it. So here we are busy doing lots of programming and doing a lot of what we think are really good things. But the neighbor said, I've never asked for that. It's not my need. What else would be a neighbor or God question? What if they originated from the sidewalks and parks, the soil of this neighborhood? 
And what if the songs were imagined from a younger group of artists who then got to share that? It could be interesting. So the question could be, who are the artists? And what are they creating? It's another question. Yeah, we got this. I, I did kind of a walking tour before the service started. And what, what a huge space. So much room and different rooms in the gymnasium and then the small gymnasium. And I was like, wow, what could happen in this space if the neighborhood knew it was available for them? You hired TCF, we're going to help you with that. <laughs> we're going to join together. We're, that's going to be our work. Basically yeah. saying but it is partially us getting out there. And no way. Here's a, one of my favorite God church. questions. Yeah. Should try neighborhood and find question. a new business How many model people do you, we you often think people need to come in here? Yes. And and well, yeah, but how many people do you bump into two years in a given week exactly. in your neighborhood? And I think that, uh, how many people? I, in my uh, neighborhood, yeah, okay. when I was asked that question, we were very much planting a neighborhood church in Ottawa, and we were about three years into it. And I'm like, I gotta, um, I don't know okay, all right, how many a, people I am bumping into. So I started to measure that. And you know what happens is when you bump into someone in your community over time, they I think it's 20 touch points or connections before you say hi. Now you're a known character in the neighborhood. All right, now a lot of and then sometimes that high can emerge to oh, a coffee, you. a connection. But then there's also people you know in your neighborhood, neighbors, and conversations happen. And next thing you know, potlucks are going on. And when I counted, I bumped into, on an average, 20 people in a week in my neighborhood. And I'm like, that's not good enough. I want that number way higher. So I would like hang out on the corner and just wait until I knew somebody walked down the street. Hey, how are you doing today? And I was a pastor, so I had more time. But, um, but we had to ask that question. Am I known in the neighborhood? Do I know others in the neighborhood? What else? What else would be a God or neighborhood question? Right. This is, yeah. How many people drive by and know what St. Paul's is? Can you imagine if there's so much animation and energy, people coming to scouts and daycare and mom and tots yoga and whatever else. Um, and they're just basketball camps and this just knowing that this is a place of activity. So now when people drive by, they know St. Paul's, not just because of a church service, but because of a space in which they're known in the community. That I'll tell you this, to... coming out of the pandemic, there is a massive need. And I think the church is the answer for this. Yeah, coming out of the pandemic. For belonging. Yeah, people have to get on the pandemic. We've always they had that. Start getting into it and start getting but out. But the dominant cultural narrative the capitalistic system in which we invest in is transactional in nature, meaning that everything is me going and doing. It's not about me being, I'm a human doing. So I go to the coffee shop and I'm not knowing there. I'm going because I get a coffee and I transact money and I get a coffee and I go to yoga and I go to um, work and I'm going to the gr uh, grocery store and everything about what I do is transactional. Where are the spaces anymore where I'm just known, loved for who I am? The church used to be one of those spaces. And I think there's a great need for people to have those spaces where they can come into and just feel this sense of belonging. All the intersections that they may carry, race, gender, 
identity where they get to come in and feel like, you know what, in that space, I don't have to leave any one of my intersections outside of the door, but I know I'm accepted and loved there. It's a deep longing. Those are the kind of, uh, another God question is who's missing? Whose voices are we not hearing? Whose stories are not being told? Now let's go back two slides. And this is what could emerge if we ask and investigate the neighborhood questions. Who knows what could emerge? Because it's going on a treasure hunt. So Trinity Center's foundation does not come in with knowing what we're going to create together. We have no idea. (laughs) Because I don't know the context. I don't know the community. I don't know you. So we're going to co-create. So the invitation is to co-create as we listen to the neighborhood, as we listen together to who you are, the strengths, assets that you carry, what then is going to emerge? Maybe the community hub looks like a social innovation center, a youth club, a daycare. It's going to require a renewed purpose. You imagining your own purpose as a congregation, reimagining what it is to be the church. What if the church is also the ways in which we engage in our community, the space in which we open up? What if church isn't just what we do in worship, but what if church is what we do all week? Better supported, healthier finances. And maybe if people are coming into the building, it's not a bait and switch, but maybe if people know the space and know you, Maybe they want to come to Sunday. Optimal usage of a church building is often not just one thing. As we step into imagining what the space could be in a model of community hubs, you could see multiple religious groups. I'm going to share stories where that is um, happening, Um, not just, you know, multi-faith spaces. Nonprofits and charities, anchor tenants, people who are using the space um, for their work, events. I'm going to hear some fun stories on weird events that are happening in our church buildings because they're just unique. Weddings, corporate um, events, community groups, arts, who knows what could emerge. So I want to share some stories before I open it up for some question. And, um, um, stories also are coming out of different contexts, different places. Um, you could easily uh, say, well, we're not from, you know, X, Y. So I'm trying to share diverse stories. Stories are to incite imagination. They're not you. You're going to cre- co-create together what you become. But hopefully they can help. Um, so let's move to our stories. So, so this is Trinity St. Paul's. If Kent Kendra was here... Um, She was initially supposed to be here and then had something else, so here I am. Genius behind St. Paul's Toronto. And St. Paul's is one of the most successful community arts hubs across Canada. They have over 400 user groups. They have 11,000 booked hours. They have 11 offices, five anchor tenants, and... They host everything from some of the best artists and musicians to the most beautiful kids doing their ballet dancing to dancing with Parkinson's. It's an arts hub, a space for community, a space for inclusion and connection. Significant grant dollars for uh, space upgrades. Um, They are financially... um, very sustainable, and uh, a hub of art in the center of Toronto. We have the next one, Knox Presbyterian Stratford, I believe. No, it's McDougal. McDougal McDougal is the oldest church, McDougal United Church, oldest church in downtown Edmonton. They uh, invited us to um, imagine what could be possible on their site, and we looked at development opportunities and and just anything that we could see emerge in this, in this space. 
and we did our deep dive and understanding the community and the neighborhood. And, and it's fascinating that what emerged was this idea of a multi-faith center um, of Easter. They hosted Friday prayers and Ramadan prayers, sharing their worship space together this, for this Good Friday gathering. That's a pretty cool story. The next one, Knox Presbyterian Stratford. They approached us to engage in a strategy for their facility, needing to upgrade it, significant deferred maintenance. Um, and we engaged with a local property developer, architecture firm, engaged in planning and business planning and pro formas and all the things you would do to discover what sustainability could look like. And what we came up with was this mixed use community hub and housing project that could serve art um, within uh, that neighborhood. And this is in, in its early phases, but it's amazing to see uh, what is emerging in that space. The next one's a fun one. I'm familiar with this one. I actually got to do um, their revisioning on mission and who they are as the church. And I don't know if you know this about Montreal, but every neighborhood is unique. Montreal is one of those in church right downtown, historic Anglican church. And Montreal has more people who are in the circus than any other city in the world. I did not know that. So when you go out and you investigate, and I'm like circus, like I'm talking about Cirque du Soleil type stuff, like not like elephants and like circus as in like very talented artists. But here was what also, also we found out is those, so there's 30,000 who are out in cities around the world. In Europe, Vegas, Cirque du Soleil, traveling around. But there's also a number of them that are in Montreal. And there was no circus in Montreal where they got to display their talent. So the church said, this is horrible. What if our space could host the circus? So they joined with a Montreal um, group called Cirque Le Monastère. And they became their anchor tenant. And on Friday evenings, they would do circus. They would the pews that were left over, they would reorchestrate in the corner and that would turn into a bar. And then the lights and they had the, because it's so high, you can put in um, the ropes and what's needed. And I got to attend the circus a couple months ago. I was mind blown. There's no way the body can do the things that they were doing. I'm like, wow. But here is St. Jack's who has this whole balcony area like this. And they're hanging out with all of the other people as an ecosystem. Uh, Anglican Church, um, it's interesting because the Diocese of Huron has asked Trinity Center's Foundation to assess all of the churches within the whole diocese. So we're doing a massive property scan of all the churches, seeing what can emerge. I've been working with six churches in Sarnia and, and putting together a portfolio approach on what could happen there. And when you come together with other churches, it's amazing what you can do. Because tangent, churches come with a laundry list of what they want. We want to meet the, uh, the deferred maintenance bill, address the budget shortfall, not lose any parking spaces, keep the pews. And we go, whoa, whoa, hang on. <laughs> no. Um, so when you come in with wanting to reimagine, then we go, what could possibility be? So this is what emerged with the architect. And what, it's why I say development is often a better opportunity. What we've seen is over the past um, 50 years, church of their land, where right now they're hemmed in and they have the biggest crisis they've ever had, but they have no landlord. Sale is not the best story when you can have a development project with the joint venture agreement that allows you to hold on to the asset and receive an influx of capital to help with the deferred maintenance, building upgrades, renovation, and the community hub. So 
this is what that can look like. And you kind of have a community hub already with the people who are in the building. Um, they're right there. So you're bumping into those people all the time, setting up community gardens, um, engaged with the people who are in that space. So the church is remaining the same. They're the little building with the cross there in the blue. Um, and around them in an L shape is going to be uh, a new housing development, 30% affordable housing, um, mixed use um, rental. Here we see Kingsbridge. This story cracks me up. <laughs> it's a Catholic church. Um, we've been working with a number of Catholic churches uh, in Quebec. But right now, um, this one uh, is in Ontario. And we were doing this work with them, and they realized, and they discovered that as a faith community, they were less Catholic than good neighbors. And I thought that was fascinating. They gave the building to the community and said, we don't want to be the owners of this anymore. We want to change the colonizing narrative of yeah. ownership, of taking the land. And we actually want to, in some way, uh -huh. give back reparations to the community. And we would love you to own this. So they set up a new governance model, a new charitable um, entity that then now holds the space with a number of uh, neighbors and associations within that community that are sit on that board and engage within so, that work. So Next one is Julian of Norwich. This one has taken a number of twists and turns. What happens when you don't have a trusted guide to help you along the way, and the church ends up doing too much, you can get into problems. And I share this story as a problem story with a hopeful end. They took on this project as their own. And again, when you go at it alone, you as the church are not meant to be experts at legal and real estate and architectural development and community hub. That's not your your, your goal, your goal is to be really good at loving people and extending the kingdom of God out in the community. That's what you're to be known for. But we've got to be known for all these other things. So when we take that on and go, I guess we're going to be, and again, when that happens, whatever that land committee or that property committee, whoever that is, they end up resigning and leaving the church usually by the end of the project. They're exhausted. So it's better, I think, to have a trusted guide who that's their expertise to then co-create with the church. But they sent out a bid to a number of architectural firms to put in what their greatest dream was for that piece of land. It's not a huge piece of land, but it's amazing what you can accomplish on a small plot. And this was the winning bid. And they then engaged a nonprofit housing called Multi-Faith Housing in Ottawa. They engaged a for-profit developer, also um, working with Larsh, so there's a number, number of um, organizations coming together. So they have all these partners at the table excited about possibility, thinking about um, uh, what this could look like visually. But no one had done the pro forma properly. And now they are struggling to find a developer that will take the project because they need to generate the amount of money to also pay for the underground parking, which is... Uh, required for approval by the city and in some ways hopefully we'll be able to resurrect it in some way but they will not be able to have the affordable housing option that they initially set out to accomplish because affordable housing does not create the income required for the project itself this next one uh, this is sea space in calgary this is one of my favorite stories um, they actually took over a church and said, this needs to be a space for community good in the neighborhood. And they have so much that goes on there. It is mind-blowing. You go, But they have 19 different arts and community organizations. Um, they have a co-working space for Calgary, to, for Calgary to experiment and explore. Here's the last one coming all the way from London. They had one of the top architects, minimalist, come in and remove the bottom pews. Um, and put in um, this stunning 
arts venue. It is a space where um, films are filmed. Um, Ed Sheeran has performed there um, and multiple other famous Sharon, musicians. Yeah, um, and it's one of the primary arts venues in Hackney. Um, and what's really cool about that space is the church continues to meet there. And so as the art hub is going on, they also wanted to connect, and this was their vision, is to do arts and justice. So alongside the art a site is filming. also homeless care, food bank, youth, community garden, and a pub. The pub, the pub Why not? is actually like they actually make their own craft beer and very well known within that community. And all of the uh, a number of dollars from that pub also go to to help um, give back to justice initiatives. So who knows what's possible when you start to imagine? I want to wrap up with this and then take your questions. Yeah, we're running out of time. Go to the last, I think this is the last slide. This is what we do. What we do, and not all of this, because not every church needs all of this, but we call it the art of the possible. And whenever you step into creating art, you don't know what the end's going to look like. I have a friend out of Portland who um, was on tour with us, Sonia Gibbs, and she's a um, abstract painter. She says, whenever I go to paint, I have no clue what's coming out. Like, it comes from inside. And we don't know what's going to come out as we engage in this process. But we're going to look at the property itself. And we're going to do a proper, a proper property study that looks at what's possible here. Assessing the building itself, looking at the building condition, urban planning, existing cost analysis on, on the space. Yeah, exactly. We also want to engage within you, yeah. with you as the congregation. Um, what are opportunities? Yeah. And things that maybe are sitting right here amongst us. We want to listen with you. We want to listen to the neighborhood. What are they saying? Doing stakeholder interviews and engaging um, with the community itself as to what are the needs? What are the opportunities? Often with churches, they go, we want an arts venue. And then you go and listen to the neighborhood and there's 20 art venues within five blocks. And you're like, well, there's a lot of arts venues. So maybe, like, who knows? I don't know what the need is, but let's, let's do the neighborhood mapping to discover. Pro forma, all that simply means is let's run the numbers. Let's look to ensure that whatever is created could be financially sustainable. If we need to, we have access to architectural design, property brokerage. Um, and then our whole goal is to create a hypothesis. At the end, we want to create a scenario that says this is the best one that we think could work for you. And now the last slide. So it's going to take a different mindset. And I like the metaphor of church versus farmer's market. From owner to ecosystem. The church, you own it. It's yours. You're the only occupant. Be responsible for all the upkeep. The animation of the space. It's yours. You own it. You do with it what you want. I love in Ottawa on the weekends when I get to walk into the farmer's market. And there's all these vendors and everyone's kind of pulling together and there's this energy in the space and people are walking by and it's a little bit less transactional than walking into the local grocery store. People are pulling for each other. You're talking to the local farmer, talking to the artisan baker, the refugee family, immigrant family who just came over and is cooking some of the best food. And it creates this sense of community because everyone is there from this place. Right. Different Maybe groups sharing the space, yeah, partnerships, so know what is, respecting so what each is, other. And guess what? You're sharing the financial burden. To, each one participating on how much land they actually in, its, own. in its success. Just because they sold the lands. Any questions for me? I said a lot. Hopefully you have a bit of imagination around what's possible and direction we're going in. 
Um, but if you don't, or if there's questions that emerge, please. Yes. There are two, one is your neighbor where you're at. So there is where you're knowing and you know the neighbors with where you're at. But then also the church is part of a community as well. Said, can you repeat the question? And how do we reach out to the place in which the church is located? Getting to know the neighbors in the community here. And I think it's a both and. It's not that, you know, you could all move in closer to the neighborhood. That's unrealistic. Um, but how do we participate within what's going on within the community here? And, um, and it's important to do that as well. So it, it is a hurdle to overcome. Yeah, I think what will happen is, is as we do the space assessment and then assess also needs in the community, ghost kitchens is a massive thing right now. Um, COVID has created this reality where people are going out less and now eating at home more. So Uber Eats. And so you can actually have a restaurant that's purely online. And so there's lots of an innovation around that. Yeah. And it's allowing, again, immigrant families, refugee families to make a very good living without needing to put a mortgage down or pay high rent. So become known by, by going to farmer's markets and whatever else. So, um, so sometimes commercial kitchens are a massive help to the community ecosystem. Um, and that's something that we would discover. What allows for renovations to happen, and again, as we look at your land asset, um, you, you do have a very significant asset in your, in your land. There's a, there's a pretty, pretty good sized plot in a very marketable, high market area. So again, there could be development, potential develop, development opportunity, um, receiving the income required to do those necessary renovations. Because again, churches, I like to say, they're kind of like grandma's, great grandma's living room. Um, great to visit on a weekend, but no one really wants to stay. Um, and if the church can animate, can renovate the space to where the neighbors actually want to be here, where, you know, it doesn't smell like mildew. And, and this is I'm, some, not this one, because I did, did not smell like that down there. But most old churches are kind of musty and like they're, people don't want to rent those. So how can we help that um, and renovate to give them the space that they actually want? So, yeah. Yes, that's exactly it. And it does shift again, if we go down this path, um, governance shifts because now you're having a separate entity. So we would work through governance where you actually have a separate not-for-profit where there's a, you know, church members who would sit on it, but you're not the only ones. Um, and you run it as a separate community hub or community center. Um, yes, that's the, that's the dream. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to me talk. Um, I hope that you have a little bit uh, more of a sense about what our work is, that there's a little bit more imagination and excitement around possibility, because um, I have tons of hope in this faith, com faith community. Um, you have two amazing uh, staff leaders who are leading you forward, um, and I trust and hope that uh, this faith community can continue, but it won't continue like it looks like now, and that's okay. Because if we do not change, we are going to spend the next years managing the decline of the church. We have to change. We have to innovate. We have to imagine a new way so that we can rebuild back what's been lost. Thank you.